Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... What was your reaction when you first saw the film? I had just come back from an audition, and there was a theater that had this little kiosk kind of thing outside of it, and they would run the trailer, and it was a trailer for Saturday Night Fear, which I had never seen, and I was just sort of blown away. <laughs> and then it was one of those, hey, are you her? You look like her, are you her? And I, I said, yeah. And not sort of, re and he went, it's her, this is her. And I got so freaked out and I got so scared. I went, I have to go. And I just sort of went running back. Is the rumor true that you had to, you, you had just worked on dropping your Brooklyn ease when it, all of a sudden you had to bring it back again? So when I went in to audition for this part, this wonderful casting director named Shirley Rich said, um, I thought you were from Brooklyn. And I said, I am. She said, well, you don't sound like it. I said, I don't. So she said, go home <laughs> to your family and live with them for a while, and then I'll call you back to meet the director. And so, you know, I called, Mom, can I? She says, oh, sure, come on, we'll have coffee, it'll be fine. Yeah, come on. Are you still friendly with John? You know, John has always been and will always be this incredibly lovely man. I mean, he's just, he is such a, 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 a sweet, caring individual. Um, and even though with all the success, you know, he's incredibly intelligent, and, but he never takes on this, you know, too, too good for the room, too good for the, you know, he's, he really, he's, he lives in the moment, and, and he's stayed very much true to himself. To many of you, this will sound like ancient history, like the pyramids or Elvis. But these three words, Saturday Night Fever, ruled the movie world in the late 1970s. It made John Travolta a movie star instead of just Vinnie Barbarina. It made the Bee Gees pop icons. And it catapulted today's guest into dramatic actor history. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, actor from Saturday Night Fever and TV's Angie, Donna Pescow. If you'd like to be more involved with us at Still Here Hollywood, you definitely can. Just visit patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. You can support us for as little as $3 a month. Then you can see who our upcoming guests will be and submit questions for them. You can even tell us what stars you want us to have on as guests. You'll also get exclusive behind-the-scenes info, pics, video, and more. Again, that's patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. Thanks for coming in today. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Our I'm, little set here. I'm happy We're to still be here. here in Hollywood. Yeah. We're happy you joined us. Tell me, you had just left school when you got the role in Saturday Night Fever, hadn't you? I was, um, I was out of school for about a year, not quite, yeah. So. How many auditions had you been on? This was the first film audition I ever did. Um, I had done uh, theater for the most part. Um, in fact, I think this was the first on camera anything I'd ever done. And uh, this agent I had at the time was really brilliant and saying, ah, it's nothing, it's a little role, don't worry about it, you know, just, okay. <laughs> well, it was kind of a small role in terms of the big picture, but you did things with it. You won a Golden Globe for that, for that role, didn't I, you? I, I won the, um, the New York Film Critics. New York Film Critics. Best, best supporting, yeah. But, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you get some of, in your career, you get one of those opportunities where you can really stretch, stretch it all out and, and do what you've been wanting to do. And I was just so lucky to do it so early on. So I wasn't, um, I wasn't as nervous because I didn't think about, you know, how well the film would do or, or what all of that would be like. You know, it was just a job. So lucky. A good job. A very good job. Uh, were you surprised at what a huge hit it became? Oh, yeah. I think everyone was. Even, even the studio. I don't think anyone uh, thought that it would be such you know, lightning in a bottle and it just explode that way. Can anybody explain it? I'm sure there are people that can explain it better than I can. But it, I think the film was uh, very much of that era. You know, I think... In the 70s, there were more sort of, you know, gritty films, art films, films that had really sort of intense storylines. And then 
when they coupled that with the Bee Gees music, you know, it was just this incredible recipe for success. Um, but I don't, I don't know whether anyone really expected it to be what it became. I heard uh, Leonard Maltin say not long ago that every movie is a reflection of its time. Mm -hmm. And that certainly was. Mm -hmm. uh, John had just kind of, John Travolta had just kind of come on the scene with Welcome Back, Cotter. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the huge star he became and still is. Um, what was it like working with him in the beginning? Um, working with John was incredible. Uh, he, he was so generous with making everyone feel comfortable and not feel like they weren't equal in importance. And, um, you know, he set the tone, I think, and everyone was so, uh, much of a team player and everyone wanted it to be great and everyone wanted it to be the best they could, you know, do it. And um, he did something that I always thought was so extraordinary. After every scene, after every take, he would always say, are you happy? Would you like another take or are you happy? And I was always so amazed that his concern was very genuine, that everyone really felt good about what they put out. You know, they're on the on film, so... Couldn't have been better. I remember uh, after a long, quite a while after Saturday Night Fever came out, I went to see John in Get Shorty. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he has that scene where he dances with Uma Thurman. Well, when he starts dancing, the audience went crazy. And I think it's all because of Saturday Night Fever. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's he was an extraordinary dancer. Uh, and he still is. You know, I did a commercial... Um, this past uh, Christmas with him, where he's Santa Claus, and they kind of was a Saturday night, they called it Holiday Night Fever. And it was kind of a fun thing. And uh, he still has the moves. He really, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I guess it's not the kind of thing you lose. I, I, I think, you know, it's so ingrained in people that, that dance, you know. Um, what kind of disco dancing did they have you do in, in terms of getting prepped for the role? I had never been to a disco, and before, <laughs> I was such a fish out of water, um, before we started filming, uh, a lot of us went to the club, because it was an actual club, but John couldn't go because he was too recognizable, um, and kind of took it all in and all, and I thought, wow, you know, these these folks are really great dance, the kids, you know, were really great dancers, but they were so serious about it. This was not just whatever. You know, they really had routines set, and they, you could see, uh, rehearsed, and really were very, very serious about how their image was perceived on that dance floor. You've been in so many things, haven't you? Television, film, stage. Lucky, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how have you maintained your career? Oh, I don't know. I think luck has a great part of it. Um, I, I just think so much of it is being really in a, a, a good mental place and being available to do what is presented to you and, uh, be excited about it. And, you know, I've just been so fortunate to, to be in so many good projects and, you know, I... I think I think a lot of it has to do with just being on a roll. I mean, I've had down years, you know, where I, I sort of sit there and think, well, maybe dental hygienist is a good thing, you know. But <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's a it's a roller coaster. You never know. Um, but I've been really blessed, and I think attitude is a lot of it. Did you make the right choice of career? Oh, I didn't have a choice. No, no, I was such a hammy kid. Um, I don't think. If, if I would have been a doctor, I would have lost every patient. I, don't, I just don't think I was <laughs> cut out to do anything else. You mean like, I'll be right back? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'd love to take out your, you know, appendix, but I have an audition. So, I know. <laughs> you uh, were raised in Brooklyn, right? Mm-hmm. And the character you played, Annette, mm -hmm. is from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Is it true? Is the rumor true that you had to you you had just worked on dropping your Brooklyn ease 
when it, all of a sudden you had to bring it back again? It is true. It is. I, um, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, uh, and they have a very full curriculum, um, and, you know, very much like, like a lot of conservatories, they have all aspects of uh, getting you ready to do professional work, and they had speech class. And I remember that he was a very sort of austere kind of uh, teacher, and he said, if you have a regional accent, you will never work. I'm telling you now, you need to sound very, very much like you come from nowhere, standard American speech, and so, all of the, you know, all of these kids, all of us who, you know, some were from Texas, some were from the South, some were from the East Coast, everybody had a regional accent. And um, we worked very hard to make sure we sounded like we came from nowhere. And I would habitually start to correct myself because I didn't, I, I you know, I thought it's never going to work. So when I went in to audition for this part, this wonderful casting director named Shirley Rich, said, um, I thought you were from Brooklyn. And I said, I am. She said, well, you don't sound like it. I said, I don't. And I was trying, but it, it seemed false, you know, because I was so confused at that point what to sound like. So she said, go home <laughs> to your family and live with them for a while, and then I'll call you back to meet the director. And so, you know, I called, Mom, can I? She says, oh, sure, come on, we'll have coffee, it'll be fine. Yeah, come on. You know, and then... There we are. <laughs> Although I think I was a little bit heavier with the accent that I did for Annette. It was, it was a, a little bit more intense. Did you have to work on losing it again? Um, not, not so much. I think I slip in and out of it. And now I, I think I, I have to really make sure I don't go there because when I'm comfortable, uh, I sort of go back into it a little Get bit. Get comfortable. Okay. Sure, no problem. <laughs> um, tell me about Angie. Angie was such a sweet story. It was Cinderella, really. Um, and Gary Marshall had a million shows on the air at the time. Uh, all these great, you know, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, uh, I think Mork and Mindy. Um, and we were all at Paramount. And we were all like one soundstage next to another. It was like sitcom college. It was kind of amazing. Um, but Angie was, you know, again, this really lovely story that was not uh, silly pie in the face, which I have total respect for silly pie in the face, but this was, was more of a, you know, um, a love story in a way. And, and the, you know, one side of the tracks meets the other side and, and blue collar meets white collar and everything that people could relate to. So it was very sweet. What was your experience working with or for Mr. Marshall? I mean, it was just, it was a gift. Um, he had such a, I know this is going to sound cliche, but he had a sense that all of his shows, people on his shows, it was like a family. And it wasn't, you know, something that you wanted to have to come to. He wanted you to want to be there. And so it was just this lovely vibe all the time and he hired the best people so you know the writing was great the pardon me the production was great um and we had an amazing cast so you know it was really a pleasure he was so i think naturally funny oh he pitched this show to me and i mean having gary marshall pitch a show is a show in itself um and i just i i I kept pinching myself, thinking, am I really here? Is this really happening? You know, because he was hilarious. You know, he said, this is a great show. You're going to, it's a girl. She meets a guy, and they have, he's very rich, and she doesn't, she's very blue collar. She doesn't know how to live in a rich world. And they get a maid, and the maid teaches her how to live there and how to act, and everybody gets along. You know, it's like hilarious. <laughs> he, uh... I think he directed the movie Runaway. Oh, I know he directed the movie Runaway Bride, mm. and with Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. It was supposed to be kind of a distant sequel to Pretty Woman, but I remember going to a screening. It was at Paramount on a Saturday night, and the the print was late, and so he stood up before a, a 
an, a theater full of people and he just vamped for about 30, 45 minutes. He was hysterical. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, what talent he had. Great And he guy. loved what he did. So, you know, that was part of what was so appealing. You know, he really, j just his heart and soul was so in it. And his sister Penny. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, and I think he directed a number of episodes of Laverne and Shirley, although I'm not positive. I didn't do my research on that part. But I just know he was a great guy. Oh, amazing. And uh, again, you know, I've had this incredible run of luck with uh, first time experiences. That was my first TV show. Uh, Saturday Night Fever was my first film, you know, and to, to experience the kind of uh, production, the kind of um, artistic. Uh, full-on uh, scene, you know, in, in all of it. It was just amazing. You know, I, I was so blessed and very spoiled very early on. So I just assumed that's how it was going to be all the time. Au contraire. Au contraire. <laughs> um, how did uh, Saturday Night Fever change your life? Oh, I went from leaving pictures and resumes to, you know, getting phone calls saying they want to, you know, set up a meeting with you and Dino De Laurentiis. And I thought, do you have the right number? You know, it was just, it was a leap. It, it made a career happen, you know. Um, and uh, I was really just blessed because I had no clue <laughs> that, I mean, I knew this was unusual and I knew that I was really in a, in a world that I didn't quite understand yet. Um, so I was overwhelmed, I think, a lot of the time. And when I look back on it now, I think, I think of it differently because I, I realized just how spectacular. At the time, I just kept going forward thinking, all right, just get through it and it'll be fine. I was, you know, nervous all the time. I've had experiences like that. Yeah. Uh, usually when I'm dating. Um, <laughs> just get through it. That's it. Um, you had to do quite a bit in that movie. I mean, you ran the gamut of emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, the backseat of a car, uh, a member of your crew, um, your group that you were friendly with in the movie, uh, falls off the bridge and dies. Uh, I remember you particularly in that scene because you had to get so emotional um, that it was very effective. Um, Thank you. Do you ever wish you could go back and experience it again? You know, it's it's a, that's a great question. Um, I was so young and new to it all, and I had such good training. I had graduated from the um, academy, as I said, and then I worked with Lee Strasberg, and I had wonderful, you know, training, and I was so able to just immerse myself in the work and not think about all the exterior things, whether it'll be successful, what this will do for my career, will it make a lot of money, you know, all of that, none of that was in my thinking because I, I didn't know anything about it and I didn't think to think about that. <laughs> so I was really so into the the scenes and the character and what was going on within the film i i don't know if i could do that again because i know too much now and i'd worry about other things now and you get not judgmental in a bad way but you start to almost um start thinking about what it's going to look like before you've even done it. So you're, you're working on two, two different levels. One is like, what'll be, you know, what, how should I do this and how will it look on film? And what am I doing with the character? You know, where Saturday Night Fever, it was just acting. It was just about that, which was, I don't, I don't think there's anything better for an actor. Yeah. When's the last time you saw it? You know, I they um, oh gosh, it's it's got to be at least 
five or six years ago. I mean, I've seen pieces of it, of course, but just to really watch the whole thing, they did a um, a screening of it at Hollywood Forever. They have these oh yeah movie the cemetery yeah, yes, and so they asked me to speak and sort of introduce the film. Uh, and my son, who was, I guess, twenty maybe. Oh no, wait a minute, he was younger. He so. You know, he came to the with my husband and I. We, you know, we all. And this was the first time he'd seen this film on a big screen, in its entirety, and uh, that was exciting for me and scary for me all at the same time. You know, because of all these scenes we're discussing. Um, so that's the last time I really saw it where I was emotionally invested in it. I saw it not too long ago. I don't know why, but I just called it up. You know, now with television, you can just sure. speak into your remote control mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. up it comes, It's which I think is great. Yeah. Uh, we never had that when we were younger. No. Um, we had, well, I, we had one television and everybody had to, you know, decide who was going to get their choice of show. <laughs> and we had to make certain the air, antenna was in the right <laughs> direction and we had a little thing that you used that would rotate the oh, antenna gosh, on the that's roof. that's so funny. Hey, and we were the last to get color TV. We were too, um, we were too. Yeah. And we'll be right back. What was the whole audition process like for Saturday Night Fever? It was, um, from what I remember, they, they gave us uh, sides, which are just, you know, little pieces of the script, which made very little sense outside of, um, you know, having the whole script, but nobody is given the whole script at, you know, at that point in your career very rarely. Um, and so it was partially uh, the material on the sides and a lot of improvisation, and um, which I loved, you know, that actually made it better for me. Uh, so they'd give you, you know, I, the first, by the way, um, we had uh, two different directors. Uh, initially, John Abelson was supposed to direct it. So I had a few auditions with him. And then um, when they switched directors uh, and brought John Batam on, I had a few auditions with him. So, you know, it was this interesting process where somewhere in the middle there was a, a pretty good time factor. Uh, so I just assumed it wasn't happening. And again, because I didn't know anything about the movie, or the, and I thought it was some little role. I kept thinking, why are they bringing me in so many times on this little sort of, I'm thinking it's like a walk-on or something. But um, anyway, so that was the process was, you know, for the most part, the sides and, and a lot of improv, just to get, you know, I think, I think both directors really wanted it to be authentic, and that's what they were going for, to really make sure it was a believable character. And then Gene Siskel came out and said it's one of the best movies ever made. Isn't it extraordinary? And he even bought John Travolta's suit he at did. auction. He did, yeah. Um, that kind of help doesn't hurt. Does not hurt. One of the um, biggest critics of the time. Uh, what was your reaction when you first saw the film? Wow. Um, you I must was have been blown nervous away. that I night. was blown away. I mean, there's, there's a funny story where I was... Um, you know, I think it took almost a year, I guess, from the time we finished till it was released or we're close to it. And so, you know, I'm back on, you know, auditioning for Broadway shows and whatever. And I was walking down uh, Broadway and there was a theater. I had just come back from an audition. And there was a theater that had this little kiosk kind of thing outside of it. And they would run the trailer, like there was a little TV monitor inside, and they'd run a trailer of an upcoming film. And there's a bunch of people standing around it and uh, I'm kind of thinking oh and I made my way into it and it was a trailer for Saturday Night Fear which I had never seen and I was just sort of blown away <laughs> and I'm standing there obviously people think she's a little bit over the top here like looking at all this and then it was one of those hey are you her you look like her are you her and I, I said yeah and not sort of re and he went it's her. This is her. And I got so freaked out and I got so scared. I went, I have to go. And I just sort of went running back. But it was very, it was very freaky. It was very, very weird. Were you friends with Karen Gorney on the set? 
No, uh, no, not really. I mean, we were when we'd be there at the same time, but it was very rare because we didn't have any scenes together. Right. Except for that the... dance uh, scene, you know, obviously at the end. Um, so. And you were competing for the same man, kind yeah, of. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really funny because you could do a movie and never meet the other people that are in the film unless you have scenes together. And, uh, you know, I, of course I had met her and, you know, we were able to get to know each other to some extent. Um, but I think I got to know her more after the film. So. Are you still friendly with John? Yeah. I mean, I don't see him very often, but, you know, that commercial that we did last year was sort of amazing because, you know, suddenly we're revisiting that whole world again. Um, and that was kind of spectacular. And, you know, John has always been and will always be this incredibly lovely man. I mean, he's just, he is such a, 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 a sweet, caring individual. Um, and even though with all the success, you know, he's incredibly intelligent, and, but he never takes on this, you know, too, too good for the room, too good for the, you know, he's, he really, he's, he lives in the moment. And, and he's stayed very much true to himself. Oh, you've been married to your husband, Arnold, for a very long time. I know. Tell me about that. The thinking, and I, to, the thinking I, is, from the outside looking in, that Hollywood is full of divorced people. Yeah, I know. And, and, and we're married, uh, let's see, it will be 38 uh, years. And I think that's a golden anniversary in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have to say, with, with all of the um, luck I have had in my career, this is some of the luckiest stuff that ever happened to me, is meeting Arnold and, and having our son. And uh, it's, that keeps me more grounded and more in touch with reality than anything else. And, um, you know, I really am one of those people that I love to work but I also love to go home. And I, I feel so fortunate that um, even though he and I have been married all this time, nobody makes me laugh more. Nobody uh, is better company. I can't, during COVID, when everything was shut down, you know, I occasionally I'd say to him, gee, you know, it's, it doesn't feel all that different. I mean, it does, of course, in terms of going out and seeing friends and all that. But, you know, I, I was happy to spend 24-7, you know. And there, there'd be moments, you know, we'd say, let's take a break. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, for the most part, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still wonderful. What does Arnold do? He was in advertising. He had his own agency, and he's a writer. So um, he you know, did a lot of uh, very well-known copywriting in various uh, times of his life until before he uh, opened up his own agency. So he had a, a real understanding of, of this world without being in the same field as me, which was a really good thing. I would imagine it would be difficult to come home and having done the same thing, both of you, all day long, you need to get away. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's great to know what's going on in someone's work life and what it takes for them to do that and respect that. Um, but that that requires a lot of give and take, and it, and it doesn't always work. You know, somehow we lucked out. You know, I mean, there's always hills and valleys, but you know, I've always said I'm I'm. I'm better with him than I'd ever be without him, you know. Did you keep anything from the film? You know, again, hindsight, right? If I, if I would have thought about it, I would have kept that little jacket uh, because it was just such a, an iconic thing for that character. Uh, but no, I didn't. I kept the cross that she wore. I, if, I, if I can do it, I will always ask if I can take one little sum, you know, from each character. Uh, but no, I didn't. I didn't take any of the. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure all of that polyester is still alive somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Say, I think I missed it somehow. I don't know how, 
But I understand you were also in the finale of The Sopranos. Yes. Yes. What uh, was that like? That was extraordinary. Um, I had watched that show religiously. I, I was so in love with that show and the characters and everything about it. Uh, and I kept thinking, can't they, can't they find something for me? Or is, is in there something I can audition for? You know, and, and it was just one of those things where, you know, it didn't happen until the very last episode. And um, it was amazing. That was the, obviously, the show's last um, uh, production. So it was very emotional for the people that were on that show. And I kind of felt somewhat intrusive because it was such a, a deep thing for um, when they would do their last scene and they would leave and everybody would sort of surround them and you know and as the actors kind of left if this was their last scene you know the the ad would say and this is so and so's last and they'd applaud and cry and and i just it was really amazing to be a part of that um the other side of the david chase was the director of the last uh episode so you know can't get better than that and and um it was just this incredible thing. And I think it was the first, <laughs> the first time for me I was in such awe of what was going on. I had to stop myself from being a real fangirl, you know, and, and just get into it because I thought, oh, my God, here it is, the Sopranos apart. This is their living room. And, oh, my, there's, there's Carmel and there's Tony. You know, I became fangirl and I had to just sort of talk myself down. You know? <laughs> Don't jump. That's it. Uh, Edie Falco. Oh, unbelievable. Nurse Jackie. I loved that show. Fabulous, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and she's a, she's a good, good actress. Oh, she's amazing. And she was so lovely. She was just so lovely. And uh, Jim again, I mean, everyone was really, and it was, this was their last episode. And I just knew what that must have felt like. And they really extended themselves. It was. Kind of like the Mary Tyler Moore show, where they all walk out. Yeah. Hugging each other. It's so true. It's um, so true. What would you tell your younger self about Hollywood? It changes daily. Life changes daily. Your your uh, status changes. Um, that was the hardest thing for me to understand because I was really I was like twenty two when I made that movie. I was really you know so I had no life experience to base anything on. And I think when you're young and something enormous hits, you know, you have a couple of paths that you can take. One is you get too full of yourself and you sort of become a bit of an ass and you ruin your career. Uh, or you listen to advice that is not great um, and that could hurt you. I was really lucky that uh, I had very good people taking care of me in that sense. Um, but I didn't, I think it was hard for me almost after I became well known. Because then when things, you know, sort of lighten up, you're not getting the kind of work or the offers you think, you, you don't know how to deal with it. You have nothing to base it on. So I know that sounds really nuts, but I think I would tell myself to just take it as it comes and don't expect things to have order. <laughs> you need order in your life and, and in your personal life. And then you, I think you can handle the craziness of the career better. But the Hollywood mindset is that always in the back of your mind, at least when I was living out here, even just doing TV, just TV, um, I always thought, you know, there's a competition going on. There's always someone out there who wants your job. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, and I, I think it's also, you know, flavor of the month. Things change. Uh, it's, it's age. You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, there, there are not as many roles for me now that there were then. And... You know, you, it's just, it's so unpredictable. And people are unpredictable. And the way they behave is unpredictable. And um, 
One of the smartest things someone ever told me was, don't assume you know how a person is going to behave uh, until you spend a little time with them. Don't assume they're in the same mindset you are, you know, be, because that's, that's, I think in life, that's a great piece of advice because you just assume people are going to think like you think. And then when they don't or they don't behave the same way, you're so blown away by it that it paralyzes you. So It's hard to regain your footing. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a life lesson. The, the movie was also a, a big um, boost to the careers of the Bee Gees. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite song from the soundtrack? Wow. Uh, I always think of that soundtrack really as another character in the film. Mm, it was. Uh, I, I loved them all. I think the um, Yvonne Elliman song, If I Can't Have You, really was more sort of Annette's song. Um, but all in all, I think every one of those songs were so great. Um, I mean, I still hear Staying Alive on the radio on a pretty regular basis, which is amazing. And at my age, I, I have a whole new feeling about that song. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, I, I think my favorite song of all, uh, maybe, maybe How Deep Is Your Love, that's a beautiful song. I agree. Uh, do you have a favorite TV show these days? Oh boy, with the 8,000 shows that are out there now, I, I, wow, I love The Bear. I love, um, that's, you know, it's like now I'm, I've got 30,000 titles going through my, I love the, um, the limited series. I was crazy about Ripley when they did the Townsend. Oh, they, yes. That was just brilliant. I love when they take another stab at something that was great and try and sort of revisualize it. I think television, generally speaking now, is better than it's ever been. Uh, because you're, you're getting some of the best artists, uh, writing, directing, acting, to, to now do um, limited series. So they have more time to really, you know, do a, a storyline and, and really push the envelope. Um, would you do TV again? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I mean, I still do. I still, you know, put my, uh, put my name out there. But, uh, you know, I... I wouldn't do something I didn't like. That's, that, there's the luxury, that's success to me. If you can say no to something that you just don't feel like you really wanna do for whatever reason, um, and you can actually you know, say, I, I, I'm okay without that check right now, I, can, I don't wanna do that, uh, that's success. So I, I'm trying to pick out shows I really really like to do. I did a Grey's Anatomy last year. And again, that, that was fun because I've been watching that show for years. And uh, they offered me a lovely role. So I thought, oh, how fun. You know, that's, it's just, it's a gift. You know, I, I take nothing for granted. What do you do for fun these days? Um, this, I, I have pot, to go to podcast. <laughs> fun, I, you know, I, we travel a little, we, we you know, um, just go to shows, go to um, concerts, whatever, you know, comes along. I, I, it's, you know, I don't have, I, I don't have a major hobby, you know, because I've always, um, <laughs> I've always thought of my work as, as the big, you know, brass ring at the end of it. So I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I'm just sort of having fun on all of it with both sides of it, personal, professional. Not many people can say that. No, I'm very lucky, very lucky. In your career, what was the most challenging event for you? Ooh, challenging uh, in terms of a role or in terms of, of, I mean. It's a dealer's choice. Yeah, well, you know, I guess the most, cha the most challenging personally for me in my career is accepting the fact that I, I am not gonna work you know, unless I'm doing another series, I'm not gonna work uh, 12 months a year, you know, or a lot, you know, I, I'm gonna do more sporadic work. Um, 
And that that's hard at times because you you know you want to do what you love. Um, so that that's a big challenge. Uh, you know, the other thing I think is deciding if you want to make a big change. You know, sometimes, you know, Arnold and I will say, eh, it would be nice to move to, maybe to, you know, someplace that has a, you know, a beautiful forest or a beautiful beach or something and just, you know, say goodbye to all of the stress and whatever. And we say, yeah, it's great. And then, you know, it goes away. <laughs> <laughs> it passes. It does. Uh, is it true you played the first lesbian on a soap opera? I did. I did. I had just finished Angie, um, and the producer and the casting director of All My Children, who I knew, uh, called and said, listen, we're, we're finally getting permission to do a storyline, and um, it's... It's, it was an ABC show, and they'd like to get someone who, you know, not only could, you know, do the role, but who's a little more well-known and kind of make it a little bit of a big guest uh, part. And uh, I, I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, okay, well, tell me about. And they started talking about it, and I, I was so blown away. I said, oh, my God, what an opportunity. I mean, yes, I'd love to, and... Um, I mean, to, to to break that ceiling, I mean, that's extraordinary. And uh, I have to say, if there is a role that was the most rewarding for me in a sense that it ch touched people and it changed the conception of, you know, just a, 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 a stereotype, you know, um, that it opened it up to reality. Uh, that would be the role. I, I would just read this mail from people who f felt that they they were represented, you know, realistically. And, uh, and they were no longer this, you know, closeted uh, element of a person that couldn't, you know, be represented at all. And, and it just sort of opened the doors to wonderful... Uh, wonderful opportunities for the gay community to be represented in a real way and and I just was so grateful to have that opportunity and and it was um, I think we did it over six weeks but it aired for a longer period of time I can't remember exactly but uh, it was just extraordinary to to be a part of that well, it wasn't all that long ago that we were non-existent. Insane, insane. You know, and being in this industry, you know, you forget that because, you know, people are, are for the most part themselves, you know, and uh, they don't have to feel like they can't, you know, be themselves in any way and, and worry. I mean, there, there, there was certainly an issue with people that were afraid it would affect their career or whatever. But, you know, I, I had no, I guess, understanding of how much suffering was going on with people not being able to live who they were. And, you know, really talking to people um, prior to doing the role and then after doing the role, it was just a horrible time, you know, uh, and then, of course, there was the whole, you know, AIDS situation going on and everything. And, uh, you know, this was my little opportunity to have a voice in it all. So I was grateful and still am, you know. One last thing, Donna. Okay. I hope our paths cross again. Me too. Thank you very much. This was delightful. I, I thank you. This was great. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All Things Technical, run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>